Good morning. Uh, my name is Ashok Gurung. Uh, I'm the director of India China Institute, and it's really my great pleasure to welcome all of you to today's uh, symposium. A uh, special uh, warm welcome to all of you who traveled from faraway places, India, China, uh, Hong Kong, uh, and other cities. Uh, it's really good to see uh, most of your old friends. There are a couple of new people here. So I just want to really uh, begin by telling you that how happy we are to reconnect. Uh, this particular uh, initiative, we call it India-China Conversations, uh, aimed at getting younger scholars, doesn't mean they are less smart than the established ones. In some cases, they are probably better. <laughs> but the emphasis is on uh, people who are either in their advanced level of graduate work or people who have recently finished their PhD. So, so I don't want to offend our young scholars by suggesting the name. Uh, the uh, the uh, initiative basically uh, evolved uh, out of uh, our experience at India-China Institute, which began about eight years ago, where we uh, started uh, building the institute by gathering a group of scholars, uh, experts. These were bit more uh, uh, established you know, scholars and experts. Uh, and what we learned through that experience is, yes, uh, they do uh, you know, uh, need uh, support, and they do you know, uh, contribute a lot by coming together uh, in uh, various conversations. But the group that really does not have any uh, space to really share their work in a senior, serious, manner, se serious manner is the uh, young scholars. So that's when, about two years ago, we uh, decided that uh, we should partner with uh, various institutions in India and China, namely uh, Beijing University, uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Yunnan University, Delhi University, uh, JNU, uh, and Calcutta University in India, to really think of ways uh, to uh, you know, uh, look at this issue. And here I'm really grateful to two you know, particular institutions. One is Horizon uh, International in China. They are our official partners. Uh, and uh, Jia Jianning, uh, who is our representative. Uh, most of you know her. She unfortunately could not be here uh, because of you know, uh, family uh, you know, necessity. She's in Beijing right now. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm really grateful that uh, Ben Li, uh, uh, who uh, you know, has kindly agreed to uh, really uh, chair the session that uh, Janin was supposed to. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about you know, uh, our you know, long relationship with Ben. Uh, and then in India, I, I really want to thank uh, CPR, Center for Policy Research. Uh, CPR is the official partner of uh, ICI in India. And in CPR, uh, my uh, colleague Nimi Kurian, uh, who is also what I call co-conspirator uh, with, along with uh, Jia Janin. Uh, for really uh, conceptualizing, developing, and implementing this particular initiative, uh, you know, uh, as part of our, you know, uh, work. So I'm glad that Nimi is also here, uh, and Nimi really, uh, Nimi and Janine, they both worked very hard to uh, put out the call for papers in India and in China last year, uh, which resulted in, uh, uh, you know, uh, a wonderful set of uh, uh, abstracts uh, from a uh, large number of people. In India, it was actually quite huge. Uh, what is it? 70. Over 70 applications. In China, uh, it was uh, around uh, 17 or so. Uh, and out of that group, we picked 10 uh, top uh, abstracts, and we invited them to present uh, in, uh, first you know, in Delhi, uh, uh, and then in uh, uh, Peking University, uh, this was in November. And out of that group, we selected uh, four people, uh, Driti Roy uh, and Shahana Chaturaj, uh, and, uh, and then from China, uh, Zhang Xin and Yi Fian. Uh, and uh, this year, we also got lucky uh, that uh, Anil Kumar, who was selected uh, to present last year and for uh, very complex reason. His visa, you know, it took almost a year, 
Uh, but he finally did get his visa, and he called us about two weeks ago that, oh, we, I have a visa. I finally got my visa. Can I come this year? I said, sure. <laughs> Why not? You know? So the, for that reason, we have three you know, uh, young scholars from India and two from China. So again, uh, uh, so, so that's the background, and that's how you know, this uh, particular uh, exercise uh, you know, uh, uh, unfolded. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and today, uh, we also are very fortunate to have uh, two colleagues, uh, uh, you know, one, uh, especially Professor Tan Sin Sen, who is, again, you know, someone that who has been involved with ICI from the very start. Uh, Tan Sen is known to everyone. He is really uh, someone, uh, uh, anyone, you know, uh, who knows anything about India-China interaction, he's really at the forefront. So Tansen uh, is going to be here as a panelist. Uh, plus, uh, he's also going to be part of this uh, session, the second session, where uh, he, along with Professor Liu Jian, uh, they will be talking about the state of India-China studies, uh, you know, both in China, and Tansen will talk about more, you know, not just uh, focused on India, but also globally. Uh, and in addition to uh, the two of them, uh, I'm really uh, grateful that, you know, uh, my, uh, 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 friend and uh, colleague, uh, Professor Lily Ling. Uh, she really has helped us in many, many different ways and serving in many, many different capacities, uh, capacities as a fellow, as a faculty advisor, as really the lead person for uh, India-China Institute's Ford Foundation project. So she's here, uh, and we have uh, Mark Frazier, uh, who is our new uh, you know, co-academic director. Uh, he, uh, in fact, helped us out uh, to select the pool that we have, and most of you know him, so he's here. And Benley, you know, just to give you a, you know, uh, before I turn it to Benley, Benley is really uh, uh, the founding, one of the founding directors of India China Institute. It was Ben and Arjun Apudarai, who was uh, at that time the provost, and Ben was the dean of uh, New School for Social Research. They really are the ones, you know, who have been, uh, you know, cooking this idea of looking at India, China together for many, many years. You know, I hear these uh, tales that they actually talked about it even during their graduate studies when they were in Chicago. Uh, so, so Ben really uh, is, a, is a, you know, uh, really someone that who understands uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, what we are trying to, you know, accomplish and he has been deeply engaged and supportive of our work. So I'm grateful that he has agreed uh, you know, at the last minute uh, to really uh, t take over the role of chairing the first session. Uh, basically, I think if you look at the uh, uh, five uh, papers uh, that will be presented today, uh, uh, it again you know, speaks to the idea that we have. In order to understand India-China, we need, we need to have interdisciplinary approach. You, know, you will really be uh, you know, talking about uh, or you'll be hearing about uh, the fifth century uh, you know, uh, interaction that starts with uh, Driti Roy's paper. And then it really covers a huge you know, a range of you know, uh, you know, both time and space and topics uh, ranging from urban issues, urban rural divide, uh, security you know, uh, dimension. Uh, 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 so, so I think in, in, in a way what we have today, even you know, with the uh, you know, small uh, group of papers, uh, is a good mix of you know what the institute you know really uh, has been uh, working hard to build an interdisciplinary conversation. So, so I'm really delighted that we could really bring these five wonderful you know uh, you know scholars uh, to share their work with us today. So on that note, uh, I will now hand over the uh, session uh, uh, to uh, Professor Ben Lee. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ashok. Uh, I just want to say it's a great honor to be here. I uh, just had a, a breakfast with Arjun uh, a couple days ago. We were talking about this event a little bit, and uh, he and I both expressed a, a great satisfaction in seeing younger scholars represented. Finally, that was something that we always dreamed of because, as Ashok said, we, we started thinking about collaborations on India and China when we were graduate students, uh, and that's almost 40 years ago. So this has been. Quite a, quite a journey together. Um, I'm going to be very brief in introducing people because you have the write-ups here, and we're, we're um, uh, the less introduction we have, the more time we can have for the papers. Let me just explain the format. Uh, and uh, there are three papers in this morning's session uh, by Priti Roy and Neil Kumar and uh, Zhang Xin um, and. 
the commentators uh, for the first paper by Pretty Roy will be uh, Tan Sen Sun, right? Is, is Tan Sen right there. And um, Anil Kumar's uh, commentator will be Mark Fraser. And uh, Zhang Xin's uh, commentator will be Lily. Uh, I guess the speakers will just come right up to the podium over here. Uh, and uh, they'll each have about 15 minutes. We're going to do the three papers in a row. Okay. Uh, then we're going to follow with the discussants and then open it up for discussion. Each of the presenters will have about 15 minutes, and there will be someone here in the front, right, uh, <laughs> who will keep us on, on on target. So I can appear to be a courteous commentator instead of a interventionist. Um, and uh, there are about five to seven minutes of comments, and then the open discussion, which will probably uh, end just a little bit after 11, uh, since we began a little bit late today. Um, all right. Uh, Trudy Roy is an assistant professor in the Department of Asian Languages at uh, Sikkim University. And um, she's been working on uh, uh, Chinese uh, Buddhist monastic uh, traditions. And her paper, um, which I actually had a chance to read this morning, is quite interesting. I wasn't sure exactly how, because I read the other papers first, and I realized that having this historical depth is really quite fascinating. And, it's something uh, a real privilege to to, to uh, have also Tansen uh, who's working in, in these areas commenting. Uh, and, and Neil Kumar is a PhD candidate at Delhi University. I'm just going to read this very quickly. Um, Zhang Xin is a faculty fellow at the School for Advanced International and Area Studies at uh, East China Normal University. Uh, Tansen is a uh, associate professor of Asian history at Peru College. And Mark, of course, is the uh, uh, professor of Politics at the New School for Social Research and academic co-director for the India China Institute. And Lily is uh, an associate professor uh, in the newly named Studley Graduate Program in International Affairs, uh, based on a nice gift for that program that was given this year, right? It was given this year. So um, we have a nice representation. And I'll ask uh, Dritti Roy to uh, come up and, and start us off. OK. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Chair. Am I audible? Thanks, Chair. A very good morning to all of you. So this is what I will be speaking on today, 5th century common era, reorienting Chinese Buddhist monastic tradition, as Chair just mentioned, a critical study. So I would like to say that this is just an ongoing study, and I'm not proposing any concrete conclusion. I'm still working on it, and I'm glad that Professor Tan Sen Sen is here to guide me through. The paper mainly proposes that fifth century common era was a critical juncture in the evolutionary history of Buddhist monasticism in China. The very fact that I see fifth century as a defining period, a very important crucial period in this whole history of uh, Chinese Buddhism as it developed through centuries. And I believed that it witnessed the reorientation of Chinese Buddhist monasticism and gave a certain characteristic feature to monasticism in China in general. Now, why did we suddenly start looking at fifth century common era? This was because I was working for my PhD on a fifth century pilgrim monk scholar, Fashian's itinerary. And there I found this passage which was very interesting. Now, so far, we know Fa Xian was one of the earliest Chinese pilgrim monk scholars to have visited to India and to have left records of his travel through 30 different kingdoms across Central Asia, Northwest India, and also Sri Lanka and Java. So most historians look at the itinerary as one of the earliest historical records. But what I would say is that there is more to this itinerary. It speaks about a certain monastic culture that was prevalent in fifth century China. And if we look at it closely, we get to see how monasticism evolved through the centuries from the first through fifth and later and gave a certain shape to monasticism in China. So this is the Chinese passage. And the translation goes as, while formerly Fa Xian was residing at Chang'an, he was quite regretted to see the deficient state of Vinaya, that is Buddhist monastic codes of discipline, 
And owing to this reason, along with other fellow monks, he traveled to India to procure authentic texts on Buddhist monastic disciplinary codes. Now the point is, we find that Fashian and the rest of his companions were all monks. And for Buddhist monks, Vinaya is central to follow monastic, monasticism in general. So then I started looking at the question as to what does this deficient state of Vinaya mean? Does it put to question the entire credibility of the monastic system that was operating in China in fifth century? Then we started looking at monasticism through the lens of Vinaya and also outside the lens of Vinaya, as was prevalent in the first to fifth century. Now we are relying on textual sources, that is uh, textual sources as uh, Chu San Sang Chi Chi and also Kao Sang Chuan. There we find that you have a number of missing links and it's so difficult to recreate history when you have missing links, you don't know what the final picture, what the complete picture looks like. We also do not have archeological discoveries that somehow testify to the presence of Buddhist monastic order between the first and the fifth century. So all that we have gathered from these textual sources is that earliest Buddhist establishments were all scattered along the Silk Route, northern and southern parts of the Silk Route, at certain commercial centers, namely Pengchang, Luoyang, Chang'an. And these were not really monastic communities, but rather small foreign settlements and headed by, you could say, non-ethnically Chinese uh, family members who would just get together, somehow help in the dissemination of the earliest teachings of the Dharma among non-Chinese as well as Chinese laymen. Now we don't know what these earliest communities looked like, what their internal structure looked like, what the internal organization was like. We have no clue about that. We also come to know of certain rulers in northern China who were engaged in hybrid Bodo Taoist ceremonies in the presence of Buddhist clerics. Who these Buddhist clerics were, how would they sort of communicate with the, with the, with the aristocracy, we have no clue about that as well. We do come to uh, you know, know of certain terms related to monasticism, for instance, Upasaka and Shramana, as you can see, in certain secular literature. Again, we don't know what, in what capacity did these upasakas and shramanas uh, worked. There were intensive translation activities reported by these Buddhist masters of Chinese and non-Chinese origin. That is, these communities would disseminate simple teachings of the Buddha, simple teachings of the Dharma, among non-Chinese people as well as Chinese people. The content would vary, very elementary teachings to very complex teachings. They were diverse in nature. In the beginning, in the early phases, you would find that they would try to somehow assimilate Buddhist teachings into the already existing Taoist um, yoga exercises, meditation practices, breathing exercises. That's how it was introduced. But between the first and the third, in fact, until the fifth, there was no translation of Vinaya codes. No Vinaya codes, no Buddhist monastic tra you know, uh, codes of discipline were translated. So we could say that there was a kind of scholastic approach in monastic institutions. They were not too much into practicing monasticism, but more into studying the scriptures. That's how it appears to me. A few of the monks who were mentioned, as you can see, were one mentioned in Sui Shu. One was the feudal prince Liu Chun, a woman named Apan. These are all fragmentary information that we have. Now between the third and the late fourth, we find partial fragmentary codes of Vinaya, which were somehow circulating all across northern China. They were somehow based on Pratimoksha and Karmavachana sections of the Vinaya. Now these are the core sections of a full Vinaya text. A full Vinaya text is more complex, but these are the basic precepts that a Buddhist monk should follow or a nun should follow. So these were some of the fragmentary versions that were circulating. Most interestingly, these were not copied. The Indian, Indian system was not copied verbatim. It was somehow adapted and assimilated to fit into the requirements of the Chinese people. And the person who was involved in doing this was Shi Tao An. He belonged to the fourth century. And he brought out his own formulated monastic rules. So what we can, uh, as an overview, could say that between the first and the fifth, what we could call monasticism, it was emerging from nascent stage to maturity, 
the codes that were available were quite elementary, and they were not really uh, talking much upon the institutional lives of monks. And they were not, the monks were not obliged to adhere to strict codes of discipline. And as I said, scholastic studies were predominant. Now what happens in the fifth century is we have a very interesting intellectual, socio-political backdrop being created. And this is what happens. There is a highly volatile political situation because the whole of North China gets divided. So there is Northern China and Southern China where Northern China is occupied by non-Chinese ethnical group of people, rulers, and South China is being ruled by certain, you know, the real ethnically Chinese people, so there is a great divide. In the South, we find that the, the common Chinese people, they have lost faith in Confucianism. There is a kind of vacuum created, and that's why they indulge in what you call an emerging Xuan Shui, dark learning. This is the time when Northern Buddhists somehow combine their forces with the southern Chinese rulers, aristocracy, and intelligentsia. So this is the time when Chinese intelligentsia get involved in the study of Chinese Buddhism. I mean, Buddhism, in fact. And that is how Chinese Buddhism emerges out of discussions. Now, Vinaya also reaches an optimum level of sophistication because you have four complete Vinayas from India at this point of time being translated. You have sufficient commentaries being written on Vinaya. So somehow you could say emergence of Vinaya masters, Vinaya commentaries, it all institutionalizes monasticism in China very strongly during fifth century. You also have the westward sojourn of Fashin and the rest of his companions. Fashin composes certain, you know, his itinerary as well as translates certain documents there, certain, certain scriptures, which gives rise to, as I say, rise of the Bodhisattva cult, the Manjushri cult, Maitreya prophecy is there, rise of apologetic literature. All this somehow grounds the foreign religion very, very strongly on the foreign soil of China. So as you can see, um, to sum up, we could say that institutionalization of Buddhist monastic order, institutionalization of Vinaya, emergence of Vinaya masters, all these were events that happened only in the fifth century. And the impact it had was, as you can see, popularization of relic veneration cult. This emerged out of Fashion's composition of uh, his uh, itinerary, where he mentions at length about how the aristocracy was involved in venerating Buddha's relics and how the spatial and temporal gap, as Professor Sen mentions, was bridged. Uh, so this is what uh, this means. And then we have Manjushri cult, where we, this was also popularized, as you can see, by Fashion's translation of the Mahaparinirvana Sutra and by his collaborator, also Buddha Bhadra, where Ma Mount Utaishan in China was regarded as Manjushri's abode. So what we want to say is that so far, until fifth century, Chinese monks were looking at India as being the fountainhead of Buddhism. But this paradigm, there was a paradigm shift somehow. People were looking now, even Indians, at China as being the legitimate center of Buddhism somehow. And they were having pilgrimages from India to China, from Korea and Japan to China. So China was becoming more the center of Buddhism. So Chinese Vinaya was walking its own path. This is very important. Uh, point that in India we find different schools of Buddhism have emerged out of different interpretations of the Vinaya. But in China there is one united system that bases itself upon heterogeneous forms of Vinaya. And then it has been worked upon by the Vinaya teachers, Vinaya masters, and then you have a regular Vinaya tradition, Liu tradition, Liu school. And that is the path which Chinese Buddhism takes. The relic veneration cult also, as I have mentioned before, makes a claim that, Buddha, that China is no longer a periphery, no longer a borderland, but a legitimate realm. Manjushri cult, as we have mentioned, there is less dependence on India for intellectual and material inputs. Maitreya cult, with the emergence of Maitreya, now during the fifth century, Maitreya, who was a bodhisattva and was supposed to emerge from his abode at some point of time, emerged as a messianic figure in fifth century. So rulers started legitimizing their rule, saying, I am the Maitreya. I'm here to end all the chaos and destruction that is happening. So somehow this Maitreya cult was utilized by the rulers to legitimize their rule. In the concluding remarks, as you can say, institutionalization of monasticism, there was a new social order because between the first and the fifth, Buddhism was fighting to have its place against Confucianism. 
and somehow it was not allowed to have its place because it was demanding a new social order where Buddhist monks would no longer be subservient to aristocracy, which was very much uh, in contradiction to the Confucian line of thinking. There was also the institutionalization of Vinaya, rise of gentry Buddhism, that is when the involvement of the Chinese intelligentsia happened, rise of apologetic literature where people write and defend the cause of Buddhism, popularization of the relic veneration cult and the Manjushri cult. So that is all I had to share. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just have a, I'm just going to give you a synoptic view of my uh, presentation. I don't have any PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation. So please from, uh, forgive me for that. And also keep in mind, I just came to know of this, uh, that I will be invited here just two weeks uh, ago. So if I sound a little bit ill-prepared, <laughs> please uh, uh, forgive, forgive me for that. Okay, uh, uh, my th the title of my topic is Rising India, a Chinese Strategic Perspective. Uh, one uh, point that I would like to underline is that uh, when I say strategic perspective, which means that I'm just going, there are so many perspectives on San India relations. And this is the only perspective that I'm going to address. I'm not, I'm not saying this is the only reality, but it is one of the, one of the many realities in the San India relations. Uh, in terms of uh, the organization of my paper, I have organized my paper uh, under th three sections. The first one is the first one deals with the met uh, methodology. The second section talks about the origin of Rising India story. The third one uh, explains the Chinese perception of uh, Rising India in terms of what are the in terms of the drivers. Then the uh, fourth section talks about why there is a, a shift in Chinese perception of India. And in that section, I deal with the, 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 the challenges that, are, that rising India poses to China. In the fifth section, I deal with the, India's re-emergence as a strategic rival to China. And in the uh, last section, I will be talking about what is the Chinese response strategy to deal with, uh, quote unquote, rising India? Okay, uh, just coming to the uh, first section, which uh, deals with methodology. Uh, in terms of methodology, uh, the sources that I have chosen, they are both Chinese sources and uh, Indian sources. Chinese sources inclu uh, include my interviews with the Chinese scholars of international relations, uh, then Chinese English language literature on India. For example, there, there are newspapers like China Daily, Global Times, Beijing TV, on, and, and, and others. And uh, also publications from the Chinese uh, defense uh, think tanks, for example, CICIR, uh, CIIS, and so on. Sorry, sorry, okay, okay, okay. Uh, and uh, on Indian side, the same approach, I've tried to conduct interviews with the academicians, mm, uh, defense personnel, and also uh, uh, public pol uh, po policy makers. In terms of uh, the conceptual framework that I have chosen for uh, sino Indian relations is realism. Because uh, my argument is that uh, the period that I have chosen, which is late 90s onwards, so in that period, there is both cooperation as well as what I call deepening strategic mistrust between Sino Indian relations. And uh, so both, things, both the things are happening together. And uh, for example, in terms of uh, uh, Cooperation. We have a. Uh, we are. Uh, there is a huge amount of institutionalized cooperation between India and China in the last ten years or so. For example, we are cooperating under uh, BRICS 
IPSA, SARC, SCO, East Asia Summit. Uh, we also held our first strategic economic dialogue in September 2011 in Beijing. Then we, uh, India-China coordinated their positions at the Copenhagen Summit in 2009. Doha round of WTO, we held the same position. Uh, and also our trade is all-time high at around, 70, around $74 billion as on uh, last, uh, 2011. However, the cooperation between India and China is fragile. Uh, in the sense that there's a uh, deep strategic mistrust which has further intensified over the last 10-14 uh, years. For example, if you see India and China, their relations provide a classic case of, uh, of realist explanation. In the sense that, uh, look at their geography, their size, their ambitions. So, for example, uh, John Gower's book, Protract Protracted Contest, sandu indian rivalry in the 20th century. It talks about this, the, the, the strong realist case in sandu indian relations. And what has happened in the last 10, 12 years is that this strategic exp uh, argument or case has become more st stronger uh, in the light of two developments, two concurrent developments. The first is at the unit level, meaning the simultaneous rise of China and India's economies have left them intruding into each other's backyard, if you like. For example, China has to source its hydrocarbons and minerals from the Persian Gulf, Africa, and the Indian Ocean. In 2008, its navy, for the first time since the Ming Dynasty, entered into the, South China, into the uh, Indian Ocean to protect its economic e interests. Similarly, uh, not similarly, re recently, it has also secured operational control of Gwadar port in the Arabian Sea. Similarly, in, in, uh, India's ONGC is uh, uh, doing joint exploration in the, in, the, in the South China Sea, along with Vietnam. And Indian Naval Chief D.K. Joshi has gone on record saying that Indian Navy is prepared to move into South China Sea to protect India's economic interests. So uh, this is what, uh, this is at the uh, unit level. Now at the systemic level, what, is, what, what has happened in the last uh, 10, 12 years, which is, that rising India's story is taking place in the context of a phenomenon which the realists characterize as power transition. Not happen, that is not happened since 1945. The reigning hegemon, the United States, is on the decline, while a rapidly growing China both has intentions and capability to uh, emerge as the next uh, hegemon. In such a strategic environment, rising India, given its resources, potential, uh, is ideally suited for the US to court. Not surprisingly, India has been described as the quote unquote linchpin in the US pivot to Asia strategy unveiled in Jan 2012 by Washington. So given the predominant, uh, given the dominant presence of balance of power politics at the systemic level and competition at the unit level, means state level, uh, uh, the analysis of rising India's story from the Chinese perspective is made using realism as a conceptual tool. Uh, in terms of uh, origin of rising India story, okay, from the what, whatever literature that I have, uh, oh, I have uh, surveyed uh, on the Chinese side, I have found that they are that the the year that they are they try to trace rising India story is 1998. They see that post 1998, India's national power in the sense its uh, mm, its economic power political power, diplomatic power, yeah, I will stick to that line, uh, has started growing. And also India's uh, uh, soft power has also started moving since the late 1990s. So post-1998 is the watershed uh, year in terms of India story being uh, seen by the Chinese strategic community. Uh, the next section which deals with the uh, the Chinese perception of rising India. Well, as a as a as a observer of Sino-Indian relations, the, the the Chinese perception of India has come full circle in the sense that it started off treating India as a as a peer competitor in the early fifties uh, and 
in the four, late 40s and 50s then it started writing off india as a strategic rival because uh, it defeated india in 1962 then china entered into the uh, superpower rivalry with the nixon visit to the united states in the f july 1972 but again if you see the last uh, 10 12 years india has again started emerging on their strategic radar so this is what i mean by when i say that chinese a perception of rising india has come full circle so same things are happening the things that that were taking place uh in the late 40s and early 50s okay why th why this shift in chinese uh, strategic perception again based on my literature of the chinese uh, scholars on india i found that there be uh, four drivers that are leading to this uh, rising india story from the chinese strategic perspective the first is the in india's military rise india's military rise Mm, I I have given all the details in my paper because I have paucity of time, so I can't. Uh, uh, I'm just giving you the the main points. The first uh, driver is India's military rise. The second is what I call India's omni-directional diplomacy. Omni, I mean multi uh, multi-aligned or poly-aligned, or you you or can also choose uh, the the same. I mean different phrases. And in this uh, diplomacy, there are basically two. Uh, uh two developments that uh, that are making chinese uh seeing india differently one is india us relations and second is india's lucas policy the the third driver is india's um, uh, economic emerging uh, economic clout the fourth section is also uh, india's uh, soft power i have given the details of uh, of all these uh, Uh, headings in my paper in terms of uh, india's reemergence as a strategic rival to china what are the challenges that is that rising india poses to china again all these uh, for example india's uh, military uh, rise is uh, Uh, is posing a challenge to china because now india has started moving into south china sea the chinese are developing this question is india a specific power because pre 1998 india used to be south asia bound but since the late 90s they have indian uh, indian navy especially has started moving into the uh, south china sea and further uh, beyond so uh, so this uh, india is beginning is beginning to be seen as a pacific pa pacific power by the chinese strategists the uh, the next is diplomatic challenge diplomatic challenge in the sense, sense that india has started joining uh, important east asian institutions for example east asia a summit uh, we are also what the chinese call axis of democracies india's relations with all the pacific democracies japan south korea australia and also the vietnam is not a democracy but we are our relation with the vietnam are also uh, troubling the the chinese uh, on uh, economic uh, uh, front okay the, the main challenge that right now india is not a challenge to china in terms of economic domain but uh, india has the potential given its uh, demographic dividend so india can uh, be a major player to china in uh, in in uh, in the economic domain and the fourth is a soft power soft power in the sense uh like india's india's democracy is a uh, uh, yeah, yeah india's democracy is a is one of the uh, main tools of his soft power so it has also started to uh, come into the limelight now what the last section what is the chinese strategy to deal uh, with the rising india uh okay whatever our literature i have a uh, surveyed from the chinese uh, scholars i suppose there is a, a four pronged strategy to deal with the rising india story by the chinese the first one is uh, what i <laughs> what i call uh, a carrot and stick policy to make sure that india us relations are not going to harm the chinese interests this is their first uh, first uh, part of their strategy the second strategy is is to militarily encircle india for example this uh, string of pearl strategy and there the, the infrastructure in the tibetan area and all that the th the third is to uh, strengthen relations with pakistan which is india's achilles heel and the fourth section is to fourth step fourth part of the strategy is that they 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 don't want india to become a player in the global 
institutions. For example, UNSC with veto power being the one. Also, the, though they are not uh, particularly against by uh, against India, they are also uh, obstructing Japanese uh, introduction into UNSC with veto power. So basically, uh, this is uh, uh, this is what I I'm working on, and uh, I've tried to uh, incorporate some of the comments that I got last year. And I was, though I was still in the process of incorporating those uh, comments when I, I learned that I will be uh, presenting a paper there. So, so thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you so much. Sinjan. One thing that I just wanted to mention, recognize that uh, we have someone very special. Uh, Tuding Nima uh, is an old friend. Uh, he's really uh, uh, one of the most respected uh, Rinpoches uh, uh, from Nima set. But I think more importantly, he's really a scholar. So for Driti Roy, I think at some point today, during lunch or his, you know, you should really get to know him. He he can also give you a lot of you know helpful. Uh, you know, input. So I just wanted to mention that you know, he's here. He has been uh, a great friend of India China Institute. So uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm from East China Normal University. Uh, what I'm going to present today is actually part of my um, uh, post dissertation new research project on comparative state capitalism among uh, the. Um, major emerging economies in the post-Cold War period. So um, in this particular paper, um, it's, uh, uh, the, the paper compares um, the um, uh, domestic uh, internal governance structures of a major Chinese and Indian national oil companies and their overseas expansion strategy. But I have some, something uh, broader to, um, to say in my uh, ongoing research project. So a little bit background of this, this project. Uh, it, intends to build on um, the variety of capitalism literature in uh, political sociology and uh, 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 political, political science. Um, and I tried to, tried to argue that um, among these major uh, emerging economies, for example, China, Russia, uh, India, as uh, the main uh, examples, we begin to see a, um, a set of institutional complementarities in the domestic national economies in these countries, uh, where we begin to see the emergence of a set of internally consistent, externally distinct system of national uh, political economy. And we might call these um, systems multiple equilibrium, um, just as we see in the um, similar uh, varieties of, uh, of capitalism among the, uh, developed, de developed democracy and the market, uh, mature market economies. Um, so in my research project, I tried to look at uh, again, the, the do domestic uh, governance structure of uh, state and capital relations and how these uh, capital uh, state relations are replicated in the national economy's o overseas expansion through the investment strategy of major sovereign actors. And the national oil companies are one uh, primary example of uh, such sovereign actors. So in a nutshell, um, the overall analytical framework uh, of this, this broader project uh, is illustrated in this uh, graph. So. The causal chain runs from um, a set of features, key features of national political economy um, to the uh, internal or domestic corporate governance structure of national oil companies, and finally runs to the uh, performance of these uh, national oil companies' global expansion. So that's the, the overall uh, analytical pr uh, framework. Now, before I move on to um, to the analysis, let me show you the, the basic information of the, the targets of my analysis in this particular paper. These are the uh, major national oil companies and national energy companies I'm going to examine in my research. Um, uh, it just happens uh, for each country, uh, for various reasons, uh, three uh, uh, companies emerge as the uh, logical um, uh, objects of uh, analysis. In China, uh, some of you might be very familiar with, among the audience, uh, the, uh, the CNPC, Sinopec, and the SNUC are the, undoubtedly the, the three so-called national oil companies in China. In India, the top three athletes are the ONGC, Gale, and IOC. Um, some basic information listed are what kind of uh, major products they um, uh, engaged in, whether they are vertically integrated oil companies or not, and uh, how much uh, 
official uh, state ownership uh, there in each company. Um, so um, now let, let me start from, uh, from China. Uh, the industrial sector in China uh, experienced some uh, uh, fairly significant uh, transformation uh, since the end of uh, 1970s. Um, in, during the 80s, roughly speaking, during the 80s, the overall trend is the retreat of state from the industrial sector uh, with a large scale of, of de facto privatization, uh, a reorganization or de facto privatization, large scale layoff of uh, former uh, SOE workers, and the increasing significance of uh, small and medium uh, sized uh, uh, firms in the urban sector, uh, as well as increasing penetration of foreign capitals. But since the mid-1990s, uh, particularly after the 1997-1998 uh, financial uh, crisis in Asia, uh, the central state uh, has ra radically shifted the, their um, general attitudes towards industrial sector. So we begin to see a strategy that the state is trying to establish an industrial sector by controlling, increasingly control the um, large share of the strategic sectors. Uh, and the, 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 the list of strategic sectors actually have been uh, expanding over time. And also for these strategic in, uh, sectors, the, the central government generally tried to create a set of so-called national uh, champions um, by directly supporting or establishing roughly three to six so-called national champions in each of these uh, uh, industrial sectors. And uh, uh, usually there are um, either formal or informal restrictions on how uh, private sector or uh, small medium sized firms can enter these uh, strategic sectors. Uh, but meanwhile, there's a, a, a clear uh, oligopolistic competitions among these, among these um, uh, well-established national champions. So such a strategy is also clearly reflected in what we see um, in the uh, oil and uh, gas energy sector. So among these three um, national oil companies, uh, this graph shows the roughly um, the energy market, domestic energy market in China before 1998. So you can see there, are, there were actually clear division of labor among these three uh, national oil companies, both in terms of the downstream, upstream, uh, the degree of vertical integration on one hand, and uh, offshore and uh, uh, onshore business on the other hand. Also, there were some significant divisions between, um, in terms of geographic uh, allocation of their uh, operation between, for example, Sinopec uh, on one hand and the CNPC on the other hand. So that's the, 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 the rough structure of uh, market division in the energy sector uh, before 1998. And alongside with the general trend of uh, uh, industrial integration and uh, consolidation, as, as I just mentioned, uh, in, in overall Chinese uh, industrial sector, after 1998, um, the, the Chinese state uh, radically shifted the, the, the uh, internal structure, market the structure of the energy sector. Now what we see since 1998 is uh, what the arrows in the picture describes. So uh, roughly speaking, all these three uh, firms are being transformed into both vertically and uh, uh, horizontally integrated uh, oil giants. Um, all these firms are now engaged to various degrees, both downstream and upstream uh, assets. They're also um, engaged in both offshore and uh, uh, onshore business, and they're no longer um, uh, strict divisions in terms of geographic uh, division in their uh, domestic operations. Um, so that's the um, general structure of uh, the energy sector in China after 1998, the reorganization. Um, let me go back to um, that's the industrial sector, uh, industrial uh, structure. On the other hand, although um, China is still described in the Western uh, uh, social science literature generally as an autocracy or authoritarian uh, state, in terms of uh, bureaucrat bureaucratic politics and especially economic regulation, uh, at, least, uh, at least since the mid-1980s, we start to see an increasing degree of uh, fragmentation in the, the way that the, the, particularly the central state regulates the economy. So um, the, here I borrow from uh, several um, established scholars' work on bureaucratic politics in China, um, uh, uh, use the concept of fragmented authoritarianism, and, and uh, uh, add one more concept, uh, what I call um, competitive regulations, which means 
Um, constantly, we see in the regulatory structure of the Chinese central state multiple um, uh, bureaucratic organs competing for both political, political authority, bureaucratic uh, control, and as well as economic resources. Um, there's generally no um, well uh, centralized um, bureaucratic control mechanism when it comes to regulation of strategic, uh, strategic uh, uh, sectors. On, uh, it actually mirrors, to some extent, mirrors the um, oligopolistic competition a structure we see in the industrial sector. Um, um, on the other hand, those um, fragmented authoritarianism uh, structure um, relies uh, primarily on institutionalized personal control as the key mechanism to ensure central government has a direct say over these firms' uh, decision-making process. So overall, what we see as a consequence of the previous uh, characteristics of uh, industrial structure and bureaucratic politics, overall, we see since the, 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 the uh, mid-1990s increasing um, competition among the three national oil companies, both domestically and internationally. Um, that's, that's what some of the scholars call, um, uh, in the Chinese case, the so-called bottom-up global ex expansion. Um, most of these firms constantly take an initiative, try to engage in very aggressive, uh, very assertive um, uh, uh, expansion uh, 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 in the global market. Now, here is um, some of the original data assembled um, uh, so far for this project. In this graph, you see a geographic distribution of all the major upstream projects these three Chinese national oil companies has been engaging in since the mid 1990s. Um, and the darker the, darker the, the, the color, uh, the more uh, um, projects these uh, three NLCs are engaged in. So, and let me fast forward to, to the Indian case. So I assembled the same set of data for the three uh, Indian national oil companies for the same period. And I need to remind the audience, these two countries, in terms of reliance on uh, uh, international oil mar market, are roughly along the same, same uh, um, size. Actually, Indian, by uh, um, all the measurements, are actually relying more on in imported uh, energy resources. But on the other hand, we see by these graphs, the, 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 the national oil companies, in terms of overseas upstream uh, uh, assets acquisition, um, the, the Indian national oil companies seem to be much more limited. I'll go to the details uh, when I move on to the Indian part. So that's the con that's interesting contrast I tried to explain. Um, now, let me fast forward to, to India. Um, Indian state starts with a fairly socialist uh, uh, approach of uh, uh, regulating domestic industry too. Uh, this is a lo lot of research on the uh, expensive uh, state in intervention in the domestic economy uh, since the, the end of uh, since the in in independence up to uh, late 80s. But since the 1990s, there was a significant uh, economic and financial liberation overall in the in in, in the Indian economy. Um, in the e energy sector, um, this is the the uh, market division we see in the. Uh, among these three national oil companies. Um, so overall, there are fairly clear um, division among these three, but in a different way. Um, so um, ONGCs uh, are primarily in, in the upstream uh, sector, um, but IOC and the Gale are mostly in the downstream. Um, in recent years, all these firms are trying to uh, become a vertically and horizontally uh, integrated in the national oil company, just what we see in the Chinese case. But as I will explain later, it actually runs into conflict with the, the state uh, bureaucracy in terms of how far uh, integration should be uh, implemented. So overall, we see a, um, particularly since the 1990s, a liberal state tried to um, reduce direct involvement in the energy sector as a way to uh, make these uh, national companies global giants. Um, as part of this uh, uh, economic liberalization and the transformation since the 1990s, um, the Indian state tried to reduce bureaucratic intervention, grant more uh, economic autonomy to uh, these national oil companies. Um, uh, and it's the same uh, policy is visible in, in other sectors. And let me read the, the um, uh, key government documents on um, the industrial policy since the 1990s. It's very illustrative to me. 
And the, the title is Turning Selected Public Sector Enterprises into Global Giants. And the subtitle is Grants, Grant of Autonomy. So the way the state tried to help these firms is grant more liberty, give them more freedom in terms of both domestic and uh, overseas uh, 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 investment. On the other hand, there is no very little direct financial support to these NOCs, unlike the Chinese state. Um, and the state, for various reasons, seemed to be fairly comfortable to let um, uh, uh, NOC state uh, competition and the conflicts escalate into public sphere. And you see much more media coverage of how uh, top executives of uh, Indian or, uh, national oil companies uh, come into conflict with the key bureauc bureaucrats in, in the state. And uh, uh, as I illustrated in the paper, actually there are some fairly significant uh, public uh, 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 debate between the, the uh, 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 governors, and, uh, between the uh, key bureaucrats and top executives uh, from na national oil companies. Um, in terms of these national oil companies' overseas uh, expansion, Indian state generally um, tried to play uh, what some scholars call an enabler role. Um, well, the state would uh, be willing to actively try to form state-to-state uh, uh, -state relations uh, on a state-to-state -state level. But once a memorandum of understanding is signed by the, 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 the two states, all the other details, particularly when it comes to specific investment decisions of uh, these national companies, the details are, are completely up for the, the national companies to deal with. Um, uh, so I would argue, as a as, as consequence of these domestic uh, uh, structures, we see, in contrast to the Chinese cases, a much more reluctant, geographically uh, constrained, and a much slower, slower expansion. Um, and I show in the paper some other typical uh, explanation of governance quality of national oil companies cannot explain their different performance. Uh, by various means, ONGCS is regarded as much more open, transparent, civilized, well-managed firm than the other uh, Chinese counterparts. But in terms of global expansion, they're much slower and constrained than the Chinese counterparts. So these are some of the general uh, implications uh, I would draw uh, 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 as, as my uh, uh, preliminary research. Um, so I'll stop here and uh, look forward to questions and the comments. Thank you all.